My parents immigrated to Canada and were not tapped into popular culture, which meant my sister and I were raised on Disney VHS tapes and the four kids TV channels. When my classmates were watching Friends or the OC in high school, we were still watching cartoon reruns. It was very comforting after a long day of learning. This might be TMI, but it also meant I went through puberty on cartoons. It's no surprise that some of my first crushes were animated. I was definitely taken aback by Casper when he turned into a real boy from the animated ghost. Now, I know I'm not alone because I've seen on Instagram that people have mentioned being attracted to characters like Princess Jasmine or Simba. And while it might seem unusual to be sexually awakened by a ghost or lion, (laughs) maybe we're all taking too literal an approach. Welcome to Self-Help Junkie, a podcast where we explore the world of personal development through the eyes of book enthusiasts. I'm your host, Erica Ng, a communication coach and your resident bookworm. Orgasm is in the title, so you know we'll be diving deep on the topic. If you're uncomfortable with it, Kyle, you should turn off the episode now. There's lots of other episodes that are less taboo, so don't feel like you're left without anything to listen to. This season, we'll be focused on developing our romantic skills, but before we dive into the conversation with our guest, let's get a one-minute summary of psychoanalysis to give you some context on our conversation. Psychoanalysis is a field of psychology and therapeutic approach developed by Sigmund Freud. It's based on the idea that many psychological issues and disorders can be traced back to the unconscious conflicts and unresolved experiences. It might be common knowledge that the unconscious mind exists, but prior to Sigmund Freud, this was not something that was widely accepted. He believes that these unconscious processes influence our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. Ways to access the unconscious mind include free association, where patients are encouraged to freely associate thoughts and express whatever comes to mind without censoring or filtering, or dream analysis. While some ideas of Freud like penis envy has been criticized and evolved over time, psychoanalysis has had a lasting impact on the field of psychology and popular culture. One of Freud's students, Carl Gustav Jung, developed a distinct school of psychology known as analytical psychology or Jungian psychology. This includes the concept of the collective unconscious, where there's a deeper layer of the unconscious mind shared by all humans. It contains universal symbols and archetypes like the hero and the shadow. He also emphasized the process of individuation in which individuals strive to become their true and unique selves by integrating conscious and unconscious aspects of their personality. And with that, let's dive in. Today we have on Jolie Hamilton. You may know her from our previous episode 15 on jealousy, and we learned about different relationship structures outside of our own and how we can learn from those. Jolie helps couples figure out what a healthy relationship looks like to them rather than defaulting to what we think should work. She spent the last two decades studying and reimagining what love looks like, and today she's going to bring our imagination to our orgasms. (laughs) Welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Erica. Who doesn't want to talk about orgasms more. Right. right? <laughs> Something that I think even amongst friends, like we might hint to it. We may say that, oh yeah, we're having great sex, but we never talk directly about. So before we dive into all of that, what have you been up to since the last time you've been on the show? <laughs> yeah. So it, it's such a, it's such a fun time of year for me because what I find is from the, uh, about the end of summer, right through the beginning of fall, there's this brilliant, beautiful time uh, where everybody freaks out about their relationship. <laughs> it's not, I'm not going to say it's universal, but I right. will say my inbox has been full and my client roster, I actually had to do a count because I noticed that just there's a lot of upheaval that happens mm-hmm. for people, right? There's a lot of stuff changing. I noticed that a lot of people seem to get this, this sense of, oh, something, something needs to change, something should change, or something doesn't feel right. I think it's because we, we spend the summer, right? Kind of like enjoying right. the, the beautiful blossoming of everything. And then we look towards fall and we're like, oh, oh, if changes need to happen, I should probably make right. them happen before the holidays. So, right. so I've been busy <laughs> <laughs> and that's not a bad thing, but I think it's it's also maybe a little calming for other people, for listeners to hear. Like if you go through that upheaval, the end of summer, beginning of fall, yeah, pretty normal in my world for that to fe- happen. Yeah. That's really interesting that you can track that. I guess over many, many years, you can see, okay, there's a pattern to this. Why is this happening? Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Okay. So today we're talking about orgasmic imagination, and it's not something that I'm familiar with at all. So can you give us a little background? Like, what is this? (laughs) What are we diving into? Why are we talking about this? (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. So the concept of an, an, an orgasmic imagination, it's really, it's straight out of my depth psychological background. So mm. I'm a Jungian and archetypal psychologist. I'm also an ASEX certified sex educator. Mm. And when I was studying, I noticed that these two fields, they really needed each other. Like mm. our sex lives really need a depth approach. They can really benefit from a depth approach. A depth approach means that we take the unconscious very seriously mm. and we take all of our imaginal material, all the stuff that we fantasize about, all the images that come, we just take those into account. We don't treat them like, oh, that's just the imagination. Instead, we let them be important. And so the sexuality world can really benefit from that and the depth psychological world, which is wonderful. I mean, if you've ever heard about shadow work, then you mm. are at baseline familiar with the idea of depth psychology because shadow work comes directly out of Jungian psychology. Mm -hmm. And it's that idea of working on the stuff that is not yet in our conscious awareness. And I'm often working with people on their sexual shadow, but in truth, most Jungian psychologists and depth psychologists, um, they shy away from sexuality topics. Mm. It tends to be kind of shoved over into the corner when I was getting my doctoral work done. It was it was tricky to find analysts and find professors who wanted to face headlong, like just face the fact that we are sexual creatures. <laughs> but these two fields, when they intersect, there is this beautiful, there's this beautiful space where we can really experience our sexual selfhood in a deeper way. We can start excavating some of the material that we have. Like it's coming to us. It's coming to us in our visions, in, in what mm. we fantasize about. It's coming to us in those moments of erotic pleasure, that peak experience of orgasm. We get visions, we get information. And most of us have that and then we just let it go. Mm -hmm. What if we held on to it? So orgasmic imagination is about holding on to some of that imagery and working it the same way we might work a dream. If you've ever mm. heard of dream work, then you're familiar with the idea that we can take our dream imagery and see if it helps us make sense of our lives a little mm -hmm. bit better. Orgasmic mm -hmm. imagination is doing the same thing, but we're doing it from that orgasmic, yummy pleasure place. And we're seeing what we can learn about ourselves. Right. It's pretty magic. Right. And you were just talking about um, like holding on to dreams and analyzing that. Now, from the, ex I've never done this before. I've done some dream journaling just to try to remember dreams better. Um, mm -hmm. But people who I have heard uh, delving into this, they will write everything down and then they will go look up on like the internet, like what does dreaming about a chicken mean? What does dreaming about a bear mean? And like, they try to give meaning that way. Is that the same way uh, you would approach giving meaning so, to the Im I, imagery? I, I love that you went at, like, I love that you went and explored that because that's actually, it's, it's so important to name. That is what most people think of when they think of dream work, right? Somewhere, I think in the eighties, mm -hmm. dream interpretation journal, like those, mm. those big dictionaries became very popular, right? And so in a lot of like, metaphysical shops in the 80s and 90s. I know right. when I was a teenager in the 90s, I could go like find <laughs> those at all of my local witchy shops. And that's dream interpretation. Okay. And and it's sort of a whole, it, it's a whole idea that, yeah, we could just one for one substitute. Yeah, if I dream of a chicken, it means this. I take a slightly different approach. Interpretation can be helpful, but that's actually a few steps down the road. Mm -hmm. What if first I take the the tactic of, amplifying my dream mm -hmm. or, or in the case of any imagery and like literally any fantasy image I have, if I amplify that for myself, if I turn first to myself, what does chicken mean to me? So I mm. could actually do, that's a great example. Really easy. Not even getting into the sexy stuff yet. At least not for me. <laughs> Maybe just for you. No judgment. <laughs> um, if I, if you say to me, Jolie, so you dreamed about a chicken, what does that make you think of? Well, I might say, well, chickens. So when I was a kid, we raised chickens. I have chickens here at the house. We eat their eggs. Um, we try to take good care of them. Chickens feel like they're very playful to me. They're kind of like land dinosaurs. <laughs> and um, I have a lot of red chickens and I could, I could go on and on for a while about that, right? right. That's all my personal associations right. to the chicken. That's actually going to give me a lot more information about what chicken means for me. Right. And that's, 
that's taking a, a more archetypal approach to the mm -hmm. dream where we're just staying with the image itself rather than trying to decide from the outside, what does this mean? Instead, we allow it to blossom because all of a sudden, if I had a dream about a chicken, mm -hmm. I might be like, oh, chickens, chickens mean home to me. Mm -hmm. Everything I just said to you, I'm like, oh, I kept talking about home, home and a lighthearted, playful. I had a lighthearted, playful sensation in my body right. when I was describing it. Okay. I have no idea. If I look up chicken, I have many symbol dictionaries in my own collection. I have no idea if I would see home and playfulness in right. those dictionaries, but they clearly hold a role for me. And so that's the first step that I will do if I'm working with an image is like, well, what is what does it mean to me right off the bat, like off the top of my head, just associations. And it's, it's also a way to help your unconscious self, right? Your unconscious being everything that you don't have conscious awareness of, but is you. Um, when you take your personal unconscious material and your association seriously, mm -hmm. your psyche notices that, right? Like it, it's like, oh, she's, she's paying attention. Mm -hmm. She's tuning in to her whole self, not just the stuff that she thinks of day to day, but she's being present to the fact that she's more than just the things that she has to do day to day. That will wake you up. If you've mm -hmm. been feeling like you are not quite your whole self yet, this is one of the acts you can take to start shaking yourself awake. Okay. So it's a way almost like for the subconscious to communicate with the conscious if you are tuning in and being mindful, being present. Exactly. Which is why it's a it's an aspect that you could call shadow work, right? Mm -hmm. Now, shadow work is usually about the stuff we don't like, mm -hmm. but I anything that we're pulling from the unconscious into consciousness could have a role in unpacking our shadowy stuff. So yeah, this is making your unconscious and your subconscious layers more present for you. Mm -hmm. And that that's valuable. <laughs> right. And so with dream work, a lot of the journaling is necessary because it's very easy to forget when it comes to orgasmic imagination. <laughs> How yeah. do you get there? Like, are you supposed to orgasm and then be like, excuse me, I, I can't snuggle right now. I need to go write some things down. <laughs> I kind of love that. And I do have a couple of partners who I do that with. I'm like, hang on, I need to like, I need to hold this image. Um, I won't necessarily leave, but I have been known to take a note or two in my dream journal that's on the side of my bed. Yes. Right. You know, if you're going to have, um, if you're collecting images, I just think of this as a way to collect images and you're going to experience sexual pleasure, mm -hmm. then one of the things we can do is just allow ourselves to collect those images by letting ourselves be with them a little longer. Mm. Sometimes we rush to come to, if you come to an orgasmic um, peak, right? Mm -hmm. And then you start to feel the resolution. Okay, I'm coming back down into, yeah, snuggling. I can absolutely, while I'm snuggling, just like let that imagery stay with me mm -hmm. and not rush away from it. And this is, is particularly important if you have images or imagery that is challenging to you. Let's say a really common thing is to have imagery that is triggery, right? Maybe mm. it's violent. Maybe it's uncomfortable. Maybe it's exactly the thing you don't think that you want to be imagining. Great. What if you made a little bit of space and said, I actually say to myself inside, like, I'm just holding this image. I'm not, I'm not claiming it. I'm not saying it is my truth or anything. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to hold space for the fact that this is the image. When the images aren't pleasant, a lot of us rush away from them. And even when the images are really pleasant and we like them, it can be hard to own the fact that we get off to stuff mm. that maybe isn't what we think we should get off to. Mm -hmm. But that too can have really profound impact on knowing who you actually are. Mm -hmm. Because no, no psychological image is just one dimensional. Like right. violence doesn't just mean violence. Um, a, if I'm imagining a particular person, it's not just about that person. It's about what they represent to mm. me. Who do they symbolize for me? If I can just be with that image, right? So if you're, yeah, a dream journal is a great thing to keep. And you don't have to write every detail down. You know, you wake up in the morning and if you can even capture a few brief right. words to just like remind you like, oh, I had a dream. There was a bear. I was at a circus. But then there was, why was there... Why was my mom there, right? Just right. capture those things. That's enough. The same can go for collecting those orgasmic imagery pieces. 
I might just notice, um, for example, I have a recurring figure. Um, in fact, you've read a paper um, that mm-hmm. I, re- I wrote about her, Nina. I have this recurring figure. Um, I have another recurring figure, though, that's mythological. It's Cassandra from the Greek myths. Cassandra, mm. like, c- recur- occurs to me all the time. Those are all floaty and kind of nice. But then there might be, I, I interviewed somebody once about orgasmic imagery, and she said, I really just see a lot of colors and shapes. Mm. Yeah. So she's present to that. So she's like, I see purple fog. I see a lot of triangles. I'm seeing, you know, it feels almost psychedelic to her when mm. she's in that space. So she just holds that image a little longer and lets it ground into her conscious awareness so that then later, after the snuggling is complete, <laughs> she can decide <laughs> to go write it down. Right, right. So I don't know... I mean, I don't talk about orgasms that often with my friends, but I don't know if anyone's ever mentioned imagery. Is that something, is that the primary sense that we get? Mm -hmm. Because I know that friends have mentioned feeling like guilt or feeling shame, especially if they're looking at porn and that's how they're reading, reaching their orgasmic state. Yeah. Oh, it's so interesting because so the psyche's primary language is image. Mm -hmm. And so you could consider words themselves are images, Um, but anything you can hold in your imagination, right? Mm -hmm. That's how psyche speaks to you. And so your psyche being what, what you are made of, it is entirely personal. And then there's a collective layer of psyche, Mm -hmm. right? We can, we can tap into this collective sense of what is it to be a human, but the images some of us, when we're orgasming, yeah, we're we're taking in external images. And there's nothing wrong with that. Porn's great. And mm-hmm. all the better if you happen to have access to ethically made porn. Yay. Love that for you. Love that for me too. And if you're taking in images, though, it might be harder to access your own. Mm. So for the purposes of orgasmic imagination practices, like tapping into what my imagery is, I would set that aside and allow myself to, to create in my own imagination. And that doesn't have to be just visual imagination. That can also be, what am I hearing? What mm. am I saying to myself? What sort of things am I am I doing to get myself off? Because there are all the physical sensations. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So if I said, what do you do to get yourself off? Most people would say, you want me to what? Like describe how I circle my clitoris? Like, <laughs> okay, I guess I can. But but what I'm talking about is what are you doing? Are mm-hmm. you in fact like telling yourself a story? Are you seeing rapid fire images? Are you watching basically a mental movie? Are you imagining a scenario that you put self insert, right? Are you doing like self insert fanfic right there? (laughs) Whatever it is, that's your material and Mm -hmm. your material then is, it's so valuable because it is unique. Mm -hmm. So I can't tell you what you'll find in there, but I can say this would be a time to, to shift away from using external like erotica of, of any form, just for the practice, not, mm-hmm. not because it's bad, and shift into your own imagination and see what happens, see what comes up for you. And what I usually tell people is try doing maybe like three orgasmic sessions and notice the imagery and then work with that because the noticing is the first piece. We want to, mm-hmm. like, I, I call it collecting the figures, like So who's in there? Who are these, like, do these figures, these actual, like, imaginal creatures or people or animals, do they want to interact with me? Are they, like, appearing to me? Or even a shape, right? A non-figurative, like, essence? What is it? I want to collect them and, and start to allow them to be autonomous. Let them be whatever they are. And after I've collected them, now I can move out of the orgasmic space into actually working with that the same way we might work with a dream. I could take a dream, say, to a dream worker, to an analyst and Mm -hmm. say, yeah, what do do you think this means? And hopefully they would then help me draw out the internal meaning and also look at, yeah, what is the symbology of that? Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, I mentioned that I have this figure, Cassandra. The figure of Cassandra in Greek mythology is... Well, she's tragic. She, you know, she is gifted foresight because <laughs> she's gifted, we're big air quotes, foresight, the gift of foresight of knowing the future. But because she won't allow Apollo to rape her, she is then gifted with 
the the horror show that it is to know the future and to never be believed. Mm. To never be believed. So that I have my personal imagery having a Cassandra figure who shows up over and over for years. Oh, that means something, right? Like, right. so some part of me likely has a connection to the idea of having some knowings, having some intuition mm-hmm. and not being believed, not mm-hmm. being able to have that taken seriously by the others or maybe taken seriously by me. Mm. So that's a pretty, that's a big, like deep mythological theme. But let's say somebody has something really simple. Like I have a friend who has spoken recently about how she has a lot, a lot of imagery of horses. And for years she was like, I would never tell anybody that, but we've been talking for a long, long time. She's like, so I have a lot of imagery of horses and she feels shame because she feels like people will think she's like wanting bestiality. Right, right, like, right. Yeah, we're backing way out from that. This is not <laughs> about you wanting some sort of act that you find shameful. This is about you mm-hmm. just being with the fact that horses are coming up for you. Okay, great. Let's let's explore that then. What is the what does horse mean for you? And we'd explore that that the depth of her connection to horse. And when we did, one of the things that we came across was that she absolutely connects the horse to safety. Hmm. Horses are her safe spot. She was what you might call a horse girl in her teen (laughs) years. And she still, to this day in her 40s, finds this real safety in being around horses. And so we worked with that imagery for a while and how she might want an image that is safety and... She also connected to the fact that the musculature of the horse felt sort of masculine to her. Mm. I was like, interesting. Okay. So safe masculine. Gee, I wonder why a woman (laughs) in modern culture might want to interact with a safe masculine while orgasming. Right. Right. She felt such immense relief from her shame (laughs) when we talked about this. I was like, yeah, yeah, that's, that felt, that sounds perfectly reasonable to me. And from there, we got into talking about the imagery of horses and how, you know, like the the popular culture images of horses tend to be either like weak and around like, oh yeah, those horse girls and this like unicorns right. and all of that or war horses and this like mm. hyper masculine, like, Ugh. she's like, no, the horses for me are, they're beautiful and they're light, but they're also powerful. So we just stayed with the images and- what we were doing was not trying to change her fantasy. We weren't trying to do anything. I was just letting her do what I call metabolizing the image, Mm -hmm. just being with it rather than trying to analyze it or interpret it, just be with it. So she talks a a little bit about like what she sees and that's it. The whole, the whole session was like 35, 40 minutes of her sharing with me what her images are doing a little Mm destigmatizing around it being okay to have any image come up. Right. And then amplifying and engaging with the the horse imagery. If she wanted to, we could have even allowed her to engage actively, like talked directly back and forth with Mm -hmm. the horse. And yes, in your (laughs) your imagination, the horse can talk. All horses are Mr. Ed in our imagination. Um, and, And we might have done that. And that's another step we can take in that metabolizing, just allowing the figure to interact with you while you're in a a cool, non-aroused state. What does this figure want to share with you? Because here's the real trick. This is why dream imagery matters. This is why symbolism matters. Because it's all part of you. Mm -hmm. It's your imagination. So literally every figure in your dreams, every figure in your orgasmic imagination is an aspect of you that wants to be known deeper. There's nothing to be afraid of. And there's nothing to be ashamed of because you get to contain everything, the light, the dark, all of it. And it doesn't mean you have to act on it. You can just enjoy the fact that more of you wants to be known. Like as you were talking there, I think it surprised me a little bit that orgasmic imagination doesn't necessarily have to link directly to sex and it can, but it, you don't have to come at it from that way. I remember watching some YouTube video uh, that was explaining different kinks that people have, like why people like hentai, why people like, I don't know, the the different types of porn categories that you would see on Pornhub. Um, And 
Yeah, they they explained it in a way of not necessarily wanting to engage in that, but it gives you certain sensations and there is like a certain sense of safety to it or like a wholesomeness to it that makes it more accessible to you. Exactly. And I think this is a this is a great time to point out. I just had a wonderful conversation on my own podcast with um Sunny Megatron from American Sex Podcast and we were talking about how we like we all from time to time need reminders that kink isn't necessarily sexual mm-hmm. and sex doesn't necessarily like there are nece- not any categories that are necessarily more or less kinky. It's all subjective. And mm-hmm. it's such a good thing to remember. Like what might feel really shocking to you? And it might feel like, oh, I this can't, I can't, can't think about this in the sexual realm. For somebody else, might be like a Tuesday. And no big deal. <laughs> so if you are feeling a little shocked or a little stretched by the idea that that this would have to be intensely sexual imagery, mm-hmm. no, a lot of it will likely be quite mundane energy, quite mundane images that just matter to you. And what's think of it this way, it's like the veil is thinning. Mm. You are less likely to have your your conscious defenses up. And so when you you let those drop, you let the veil thin, now that unconscious material has a better chance of making its way into your conscious awareness. And if you're willing to just hold it there. I mean, I had had fantasies for so long that I I would just let them go. Just let them mm-hmm. go and over and over. They'll just keep coming back trying to deliver the same information. They may take new form, but if you hold them and work with them, something new happens. You're like your psychology responds to that. Mm -hmm. And there's this, this beautiful release that can come. So if you are having imagery that's feeling shameful or painful, um, a lot of people who struggle because they don't want to, but they have rape fantasies, which are very normal. Mm -hmm. But if they struggle with it, I encourage you to sit quietly with that in a non-aroused state and allow yourself to be with it where you're supported, you know, see a therapist, see a counselor, see a coach who can really hold that imagery with you and release the idea that you are somehow responsible Mm. for it as if it's real life happening, right? This is, this, it probably has a symbolic meaning for you. It Mm. probably has some deeper message. Maybe you're feeling violated. Maybe you're working through some traumatic stuff, but it could also be that you feel powerless, Mm. or that you are struggling because you're feeling very controlling of your own partners. Mm. Now that control could be over whether they wash the dishes, <laughs> but it can go sideways. Like our right. imagination takes these things and, and turns them and flips them and then delivers us back imagery that can be pretty challenging to sit with. So yeah, it's so it it's so much more than the orgasm, but I do think it's it's really powerful to tap into our orgasm as a source of knowing. Mm-hmm. And I find women in particular, when I bring this up, a lot of women are like, I didn't know we were talking about that. Are we talking about <laughs> that now? Is that a thing we can talk about? Because most of us, even if we do talk about our orgasm, we don't talk about it in this nuanced, like, like tender way. We talk about getting off. Mm-hmm. We talk mm-hmm. about, you know, like coming really hard. Like, right. okay, like that's great. But there, <laughs> there are all these other layers too. And if you're, if you can allow yourself to share that with other people and just talk about, oh, I, you know, I know somebody who sees angel wings all the time and her, her po- like pre and post orgasmic minutes are filled with images of angel wings. And she's, yeah, we've been talking about that for several years. And she's like, they're still there. I, you know, she doesn't know what they're for Mm -hmm. yet, but she just sits with them. She meditates on the wings that she sees. She's noticed that they change color over time. And she's just in this space of trusting that they're there for a reason and that's okay. And not trying to change it or do anything. But I look forward to, at some point, I think that there will be something that comes through her like, oh, Oh, that's what that was about. That's that's why I had all of the imagery of of wings, of angel wings in particular. Somebody else might have right. butterfly wings and it might be a very different feel to them, right? right. It's not a clear cut. <laughs> like right. it's not a clear cut ac- academic process. It's a it's an art for sure. Right. It it really reminds me of mindfulness of just 
sometimes you're just so busy with your day that you don't have the time or space to just notice things like, oh, I have tension in my body and just slowing down, allowing your senses to speak to you. Right. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I think there's, there's something to be said too, for all of that erotic imagery that we, that we feed ourselves in order to get aroused. Mm-hmm. So that's like one part of the imagery. So that mm-hmm. might come from the external world, like porn, like erotica, audio porn. I love, oh, if you haven't tried the audible mm-hmm. pornography, it's just amazing. It's so good. <laughs> um, but we have all of that and it, and that can be really useful or we can also just the stuff that we we do we intentionally imagine to get ourselves aroused that's mm. juicy stuff it's awesome but i think of that as sort of a separate category of my okay. material like that's my on ramp right. and then at some point once i'm aroused you probably notice a time when the imagery just starts to create itself mm. like you are no longer having to 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 push and it is just flowing. It's happening. And that's the material that I'm like, that's the stuff that I'm very curious about. And I just want to be mindful about it. I want to be mm-hmm. present to it without trying to force it because that, that initial driving energy, that's great. But super useful. I'm so glad, especially if you're a person with responsive desire where you need to kind of get yourself into the mood rather than just having it spontaneously appear. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to lose track of the fact that you have those resources. But then when you do feel the shift and your spontaneous material is appearing, that I have found can be transformative for people who kind of feel disconnected from their Mm. sexual self, or they feel like they have sex primarily to connect to others and they don't really have any of their own reason. When we tap into whatever the imagery is that comes for them in their orgasm, there might be some information about what it is that they actually want about around pleasure, around having sex, around masturbating. Like, what do you actually want? Mm -hmm. And you might be hiding that from yourself by, again, like dropping the images as soon as you come. Like, okay, good, done. (laughs) I'm just gonna, I'll I'll just, I'll just get right right up. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Tick the box. (laughs) That's one kind of orgasm. But this other kind it's it's got some juicy information for us, right? And in the paper that you sent over, uh, it was talking about active imagination and how maybe like one of the things that you're worried about is what if I'm not a p- type of person who gets to actively imagine? Is that something that you've like the fear is gone now? Is this something that you feel like everyone can tap into? It just takes some practice. Yeah. I think there's, oh, there's such an important point to make here. Okay. Mm -hmm. First off, I definitely struggled with the idea that I got to be, that I got to have unique and unusual information coming to me. Like the Mm -hmm. idea that I was special somehow, Mm -hmm. or I would have this information just felt very, that was not how I was raised. We were more the cut the tall poppies down type of people. Mm -hmm. And so I had to give myself a lot of permission. So for anybody out there who's listening, um, I bestow upon you the permission to have unique psychological fantasy (laughs) material. Here, your gold star is achieved. You got it. Um, If you struggle, though, with another phenomenon that I learned about later, um, I didn't know that this had a name, but my first husband had aphantasia. And when Mm. we realized that, it really changed how we talked about sex and how we talked about fantasies. Some people have aphantasia. It's a different way for the the brain to work. And they don't have spontaneous, they don't imagine actual pictures in their mind. And so if you are the kind of person who's listening to stories of imagination and thinking, that's not me, then I would encourage you to think about, so what what words do you tell yourself? Because mm. words and sounds are images too. It's We're not just talking about visual images. So I had to give myself permission because uh, I didn't feel special. But I've noticed that a lot of people who struggle with like fantasy because they feel disconnected from the idea, they just need to hear that, you know what? It's totally normal to be someone who has aphantasia. Mm. It, that's a normal way to be. It's like one in 25 people is our, our current guess about that. And if that's you, it doesn't mean that you don't have access to an imagination. It's just that yours works different. Mm -hmm. Yours is going to function probably in a slightly more analytical way or a more auditory way. Um, You might have instead, you might actually physically make art afterward to express what you sensed. 
Mm. but you might never see anything in your mind. And that's fine too. It's, there's not just one way to do this work. And if somebody has ever shamed you for saying that you don't have fantasies or, or for like, or they've said that you're trying to keep secrets, if you just don't imagine things, you just don't imagine things and that's okay. That's just a neurodivergence. Yay. Celebrate. Right. Right. Oh, interesting. Okay. So it's most everyone can access this and it's something that may come to you differently. What kind of transformations are like, what have you seen people get out of doing this regularly? Yeah. So the biggest thing that I have noticed is when I, when I do this work with clients, um, often we do it alongside dream work because what we find is there's just a different set of images that come. And these images often have a lot to do with what we feel shame about, what we feel guilt about, mm -hmm. and what we are deeply hiding in our, our shadow, which might be our golden shadow, that, that the parts of us that we can't allow ourselves to have because mm -hmm. they're too good, or our murky shadow, the parts of us who we disavow being. So this is profoundly good shadow work because my, even in my dreams, I may be interacting with those figures to a different level than I will in my erotic imagination. There mm. is a level of um, nastiness, shall we say, that some of us will engage in, in our erotic right. fantasies that we won't anywhere else, right? There's right. A, a layer of like, I can't believe I allow myself to think about that, but I will for the sake of an orgasm. <laughs> so the transformations that I see are people freeing themselves from lifetimes of shame and guilt about perfectly normal sexual responses or just from, from having a desire to orgasm at all, from mm. having fantasy at all. So many of us were brought up in households where our parents didn't know any better, so they shamed us because they had been shamed. I was really lucky and my my parents did not shame us about sex. It's like the only thing they didn't screw up. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, but but it left me noticing. I mean, my current husband talks about this on our podcast all the time, how since nobody ever talked about sex, he assumed it was shameful. Nobody right. even directly shamed him. But if nobody talked about it, you might have guilt and shame around it. If you were raised in a church that has a history of sexual shaming, mm -hmm. then even if nobody's saying anything, it might just be clinging in the air around you. So this can be a way to start working with your imagery and taking seriously the fact that you are a human who has sexual functions. Mm -hmm. You you get to have them and your imagination is also part of your normal being. And also there's liberation available when we when we stop taking our imaginal war fantasy material so literally, mm. because if I have a rape fantasy, I don't want to be raped. If I have a violent fantasy, um, I've heard numerous people talk about having fantasies that involve blood. Right. They're like, I don't want to do that. I'm like, I know, I know. But blood is very powerful. It's very powerful imagery. It's very mm -hmm. evocative. It arouses our sensory um, mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And so we, it comes to us. But then if you feel shame around it, right. it's not that you, you don't externalize that. That happened inside you. Right. So now you can get this tangle of guilt and shame and fear that you want to literally enact this or that some part of you wants to literally enact this. It's just, nothing could be further from the truth. The The liberation comes with realizing that this is symbolic material. Mm -hmm. It's personally symbolic. It's collectively symbolic. And we get to work with it from that place. And that's so freeing. So many people have told me that they're, they're now able to have their fantasies and recognize that they don't have to be afraid to mm. say, oh, that, that's mine. That's my material. Right. Work with it. And then some of them have been freed from having repetitive fantasy material that they don't want mm. by acknowledging it, doing some, some active imagination afterwards and talking to the figures and saying, I, I'm really, I'm done. This, this hurts me. Right. Would you leave? And your psyche will listen to that too. Right. And so there's a lot of transformation available from a lot of different directions, depending on what's coming up for you and what work needs to be done, what you're ready for right mm. now. Yeah, I, that makes a lot of sense. 
like the, the fear, the shame. I think I've personally felt that I've heard other people feeling that. And it must, like you said, be very liberating to then <laughs> every time you're about to orgasm, you don't have to be like, oh God, it's going to happen again. <laughs> and you can fully yeah. enjoy it instead. Yeah. Yeah. Let yourself be with it. I mean, how many people, we hear it, we've seen it in movies, you know, people talk about like being scared mm. of sex, be, like mm. starting, like they start to get afraid of, of what's going to happen. That like, we all deserve sexual pleasure. Right. <laughs> sexual pleasure is your birthright. If you want it, you go get it. If you don't want it, that's fine too. But a lot of us are in this hazy middle ground where we're like, I want it and I hate it. <laughs> or sometimes you just go through a period of time where you're like, I want it and I hate it. It's so common. And I wish that we were having these conversations more frequently. Mm -hmm. And I've had another thing that comes up around this is sometimes people have a particular act that's really triggering to them. Mm -hmm. And they imagine that it's all about the senses, like all about the external senses. So say for many people, nipple play is very erotically stimulating mm -hmm. and yummy. It feels great. And for a lot of people I've spoken with, it's also terrifying because it makes them feel out of control. And, that, mm -hmm. and the sensory input is, I feel, I feel so stimulated, I feel out of control. But when I ask them to be with the images that come up, mm -hmm. if they do engage in nipple play, then they often talk about feeling out of control to a degree that feels completely unsafe. Mm -hmm. And often there are like, there are words happening in their heads, scenarios playing out that are really scary. And nobody's ever just sat with them and said, I hear you. I, I, I right. hear that. That's, that's normal. And it's really uncomfortable for you. And so let's be with that and see if maybe we can release it. Let's see if just by acknowledging it, some of us can be free of some of this pain. Right. Um, cause we're just, we don't have the conversation. And so then we feel alone and and we don't have to feel alone, but we will have to talk about all the stuff <laughs> amongst us. And it doesn't have to be just in therapy. I mean, just listening right. to this conversation, every single story I've shared, including mm -hmm. the nipple one, every single one of them has been a conversation I've had with somebody within the last six months I've mm -hmm. conversed about this. Like, right. so this is just happening for the people around you. So whatever's coming up for you, you're normal. <laughs> you're a normal. You well, heard it here. <laughs> I love that you're sharing this topic and I I love hearing this. I'm I'm so happy that you're doing this. Are you looking to expand your reach when it comes to orgasmic imagination? Yeah. So ima orgasmic imagination has been something I've been working on for over a decade and I have not been publicly offering anywhere other than when I'm already seeing clients. Mm. But I have a I have a project. So I have a, a masterclass called the Sexual Shadow Masterclass. Mm -hmm. And that masterclass is also about tapping into what gets us off. What gets us off that we are are struggling with? Like what's in, I, when I think about the sexual shadow, I think, okay, there's all the stuff I know gets me off. And then there's the stuff that's right at the edges that I barely want to let in. Mm -hmm. The Sexual Shadow Masterclass is a way for people to start accessing that information. Your sexual shadow material is unique. Mm -hmm. So there's an opportunity. I'm actually holding it live in October, um, and then it'll be available recorded after that as well. So if people are interested in exploring this in a, in a place, orgasmic imagination is not about getting together with people and having orgasms. <laughs> you could, <laughs> but that's not actually what I'm asking you to do. It's about allowing yourself to be with a pretty straightforward process of imagination. We can do that. Um, I do it. I'm also taking it on in my um, individuation alchemy group that's starting up in January. It's a very, very limited capacity group mm -hmm. that'll be opening up in January. So it's, I think it's, it's on the cutting edge right now. Something that hasn't happened. You're actually the first place I'm, I'm discussing it publicly. Very exciting. I've only talked about it in academic circles up till now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Well, thank you so much for letting us be the first. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's really cool that you're like recently expanding and allowing more people to work through this because it does sound very helpful. And like you were saying, the veil between the psyche or like the subconscious and your conscious 
orgasm seems like a good way of accessing that. <laughs> exactly. All right. And not all of our psychological work has to be hard work. Some mm. of it can be really fun work. Yay. That's, that's nice. I feel like we're always working. We always thought like as teenagers, by the time we're this age, we'll have it all figured out. So it's nice to have a break and be like, I'll, I'll enjoy this one. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much for asking all these delightful questions, Eric. I really appreciate it. Thank you for being on. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed listening to Dr. Jolie Hamilton, make sure to check out episode 15, where she talks about jealousy and polyamory. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to send it to a friend. I'm sure the title will pique their interest. If you have thoughts or tips you'd like to share, please do at Self Help Junkie Pod on Instagram, Twitter, or Gmail. I'm Erica, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.